And we'll start off with your assessment of the retail landscape uh, when we look at the Asia Pacific region. Actually, if I may start by saying that Asia is the engine of growth because this is the place that any retailer would want to be in if you are in retailing. Retail is all about people and consumption and it's all happening in Asia. If you look at the Asia Pacific, the GDP growth is about 5% plus and that's what is projected for the next decade or so. Whereas the rest of the world, it's about 3, 3.5%. So, you know, we are going almost 50% faster than the rest of the world. If you take the total consumption that happens globally and if you isolate Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific accounts for more than 50% of that consumption. I think Asia is better equipped to uptake the new technology. Uh, if you look at uh, things like the global e-commerce, Asia Pacific accounts for more than 50% as of now. To answer your question, retail landscape is absolutely positive, fantastic at this point of time. I think retail being the front-facing industry got the brunt of it, be it the pandemic or economic uh, debacles, but they're also very resilient. They understand the consumer better than most of the other industries. Uh, I have also seen a lot of retailers getting into what I call reinventing business models. Two other aspects I think I would like to place in front of you is the rise of what I call re-commerce and quick commerce. So that also I see as a major trend uh, that has happened you know, post-pandemic uh, and post-economic debacles. Retail is big, especially in the Asia Pacific region. We spoke about all of this and more with Murali Prakash. Stay tuned. Some bonds give more returns, get more security and more interest on your fixed deposits from Sri Lanka's largest finance company, LOLC Finance. The latest issue of LMD is available at lmdmall.lk as well as selected supermarkets and bookshops. You can also access the digital version on Press Reader, Maxter, our social media platforms and WhatsApp. Hello and welcome to LMD TV. The topic of conversation today is retail trends. And we're here with Mr. Murali Prakash, who is the chairman of the Federation of Asia Pacific Retailers Associations. Mr. Prakash, it's lovely to have you on our show today. Thank you very much. My absolute pleasure being here with you. And thanks for having me. To start off our conversation, and of course, uh, retail trends is a very big area. So to give our audience a kind of uh, idea of what the conversation is going to revolve around. Can we start off with your assessment of the retail landscape uh, when we look at the Asia-Pacific region? Uh, well, thank you. Lovely point to start with. Um, actually, if I may start by saying that Asia is the engine of growth. I mean, I'm not exaggerating uh, because this is the place that any retailer would want to be in if you are in retailing. Um, I'm telling this with a lot of reasons. Like, you know, um, it's all, retail is all about people and consumption. And it's all happening in Asia. Let me give some perspective to what I'm saying. Um, well, let's look at the economics of the whole uh, region. If you look at uh, Asia Pacific, the GDP growth is about 5% plus. And that's what is projected for the next decade or so. Whereas the rest of the world, it's about three, three and a half percent. So, you know, we are growing almost 50 percent faster than the rest of the world. Uh, if you look at the population, um, Asia Pacific has about 60 to 62 percent. So, you know, that's that's quite the number that we would like to have from a retailer point of view. Uh, and also, uh, there were some interesting statistics from people like McKinsey about consumption. So they say if you take the total consumption that happens globally, and if you isolate Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific accounts for more than 50% of that consumption. So as I said, you have the population, you have the growth, you have the consumption, and there are major other shifts happening, like you know, the upper uh, income segment is going to grow by about, the upper middle rather, going to grow up by about 80% over the next 10 years. 
uh, added to this one also there is another thing uh, which uh, is the infrastructure digital infrastructure i think asia is better equipped to update the new technology uh, if you look at uh, things like the global e-commerce asia pacific accounts for more than 50 percent as of now rapid growth over the last couple of uh, years and rightly so because china is there india is there china grows at about four percent india grows at about six percent so everything is there to answer your question retail landscape is absolutely positive fantastic at this point of time well that's excellent to know and uh, and yeah right like you rightly said we have all the major players uh, in the region uh, mr prakash i'm gonna i'm gonna be the devil's advocate here and like ask you i mean we've also seen along with the positives we've also seen a lot of challenges coming in like especially on the consumer front uh with you know economic hardships and all of that uh yeah. post pandemic of course um how are these challenges kind of you know emerging and how well is asia pacific facing them to start with you're absolutely spot on i think retail being the front facing industry got the brunt of it, be the pandemic or economic uh, debacles. Uh, but they're also very resilient. They understand the consumer better than most of the other industries. So there are many trends, positive, negative. But uh, what I have seen is retailers being resilient and being adaptive. So one of the things that I have seen uh, as a kind of a trend post-pandemic is the digital transformation and e-commerce. It has been big. Every retailer has practically got into it. Just to give you again some perspective, Asia Pacific accounts for about $4.2 trillion in terms of e-commerce as against about 6.3, 6.5 globally. And this is supposed to grow at about 20% and we are expecting about 6.5, 7 trillion by the end of the decade. So that's how big. Uh, I have also seen a lot of retailers getting into what I call reinventing business models to start with supply chain. Every one of us faced massive issues in supply chain post-pandemic. So you could see them, you know, kind of going into next level with technology, be it the last mile delivery or in between changing supplies. So that was a big thing. And a lot of retailers also went to granular level. Like, you know, when I say granular level, reinventing the shop, the store um, per se, uh, to make it more profitable uh, with uh, different types of products, different assortments, so on and so forth. So that kind of business re-engineering happened throughout. Two other aspects I think I would like to place in front of you is the rise of what I call re-commerce and quick commerce. So re-commerce literally refers to reselling used items. So this, I think, partially stems from the fact that, you know, people are talking about sustainability, eco-friendly, so that, you know, you reuse the products, partially also due to cost reasons. Uh, and probably, you know, uh, also the environment that prevailed the post-pandemic. So, the, you know, again, just to put things into perspective, re-commerce currently is valued at about $64 billion worldwide. And they are projecting this will grow four times faster than retail and expected to be around $300 billion by the turn of the decade. Now, imagine that, right? So, you know, so and people like uh, even I, uh, IKEA have got into this. That's how lucrative the whole thing is. And also quick commerce, of course, you know, we want instant gratification. So people have got into it. So that also I see as a major trend uh, that has happened, you know, post uh, pandemic and post economic debacles. I hope I'm not going to be repetitive here. But like you said, you touched on the digital uh, digital transformation of the retail landscape and and some trends. Do you think most of these trends are driven by uh, businesses, like you said, because there is business reengineering that we see? Or are they more driven by consumers like the uh, re-commerce angle? Uh, so, a bit of both. Uh, I think uh, largely the consumer sentiments because the new gen has come into place and they are actually very, very concerned about the environment, uh, sustainability and related things. And as retailers, we too are extremely concerned about it. That's how even in places like Sri Lanka, you would see, you know, uh, we are going out of polythene and, you know, that kind of thing. So, a bit of both to uh, answer you there, one bit. Uh, and I think it's for the good. That's how I see the re-commerce happening. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Prakash. And, and uh, talking about consumers, like you, like you mentioned, uh, Gen C, of course, uh, they are always looking for the next best thing. Or, you know, they are always looking for the innovation uh, aspect to come into products and services both. Uh, so when we look at innovation, I think we are seeing the industry moving towards more collaboration, more you know, supply chain integration, and all of that. Looking at it from a retail business player's perspective. 
how should retail players really work towards fostering collaboration in order to drive innovation? Um, Ruandi, again, a very, very valid question, given that we are in the midst of a in, um, technology revolution, if I may put it that way. Uh, so uh, innovation, they say, is the mother of everything in terms of business. But there is also kind of a misnomer. A lot of people think innovation is all about putting out a product every now and then or some service. That's not it. So if you are talking about collaboration and innovation, that has to be in your culture, in your blood. So uh, say you take uh, an example like IKEA, right? They put out a new product virtually every day or every week and they have empowered their employees. They are, I mean, they have systems to recognize them, reward them. So it's, it's the way they work. You know, every day they come into work thinking, what can I do better, you know, in terms of the uh, augments in the customer journey. That's the ultimate goal. No? So that's that's the that's how we should look at it. So given that, you know, as to how we should collaborate or innovate, my thinking is twofold. One is uh, brewing an innovation-based culture. And secondly, deploying technology for innovation. And thirdly, also industry collaboration. Just to, uh, just to add on to it, if you want to develop a culture, if you look at these large organizations, they have two things. Many other things happen, but two things that I picked out uh, was... One is uh, you got to build entrepreneurship within your organization. So they feel this is mine every day. They kind of, you know, come to work thinking, what can I do better? Secondly, with all the technology proliferation, you got to look at learning and development as part and parcel of it. You got to feed the employees with all details of what is happening so that, you know, their innovation is more in line with what is required kind of a story. So that's one. If you look at deploying technology, now this is another very important thing. You should not use technology to innovate. That's not what I'm saying. Your innovation process is better off with technology. Say for an example, today you're talking about uh, uh, good supply chain. So it's all about transparent and accurate delivery kind of a thing. How would you do without a technology? And similarly, say automated warehousing. Recently, I was actually very fortunate to uh, listen to Vice President of 7-Eleven Japan. And for the first time, he came to Sri Lanka. And he was telling us how they manage inventory and warehousing with technology with a term called Tanpen Kandi. That is a Japanese word. I hope I pronounce it right. So it literally refers to item by item management. So, you know, we are talking about 7-Eleven. They have thousands of stores, right? And they say they know every item, which store has it, where is it, and the status. So that's the level of, you know, technology. This is what I'm saying. If you want to be innovative, then you use technology. And then finally, I also told you that, you know, to uh, look at cross-industry collaboration, uh, that kind of strategic alliance also can bring new thinking and uh, new kind of ways of looking at your business. So probably these two, three things should help you to put the first stage into building a collaborative, innovative culture. Three very different yet very integrated angles, Ms. Prakash. If I, uh, if, you know, if we dwell a little bit on the last aspect, industry collaborations, um, how is it happening right now? What is your assessment of the level of industry collaboration in the Asia-Pacific region and um, what is, uh, I mean, what more can be done? So some of the, some of the countries like developed countries, they have gone a notch above. Say for an example, even if you look at a board in those companies, you would find um, people from the academia as well. You know, so that level of collaboration. Or you would find them collaborating. Say for an example, the FMCG uh, company might collaborate with a logistics company and they can develop something totally new uh, instead of reinventing the wheel. Uh, so that's the kind of, I have seen this happening in some of the developed uh, economies, uh, but in this part of the world, South Asia as such, they are looking at it now, and I'm sure it's a matter of time. I have seen India getting into it. So it's a matter of time, you know, that it proliferates into the level that we think it should. It's time to take a very short break, but we'll soon be back to talk more about retail trends. What makes a truly awesome insurance company? Is it the skills to manage big numbers and big responsibilities? Well, that's definitely part of it. But there's more. It's the people. They're awesome. Super passionate about looking out for others and putting in their time for people's finances. 
It's not just the people. It's how we do things that's awesome. From being trendsetters of the industry to being connectors or inventors. It's about well-being and how we achieve it. Our teams hustle non-stop to meet the needs of the people. That's why we're on the rise. And it's not just about how we do things either. It's about how we improve things. Helping our clients thrive in a world that's full of awesome goals to achieve. Making the maximum out of the minimum. But wait, there's more to it. There's one last thing that truly makes an insurance company awesome. It's that we care about our people and our customers. All of this combined, it's been a pretty awesome year. And we're excited for tomorrow. Display your brand message on digital screens at Prime Locations. The largest digital advertising network in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka. Emerging Media. Welcome back to the show. We're in conversation with the chairman of the Federation of Asia Pacific Retailers Associations, Morali Prakash. And what kind of uh, environment or ecosystem should we nurture? Because like you said, we are not seeing it as optimally in this part of the world. What do you think? I mean, what kind of um, support can countries give to nurture this kind no, of No, I, I think uh, that's a good question. So as much as I talk about organizations that should create this environment, a country too should create that environment to build entrepreneurship. It starts their entrepreneurship literally means you are willing to take that risk to try out new things to ensure that customer experience is better tomorrow. So I think as a country, if you look at all these countries, should focus on that. I know some countries do have specific programs. It's not just, you know, saying that you are encouraging entrepreneurship, but building a whole host of values around that, be it the financing, be it the support that you require. So from a country perspective, I think it's a very, very valid thing. We need to ensure that, you know, we build that bridge to en enable uh, entrepreneurship to flourish. At the same time, the uptake of the company is also needed. They should also look at, you know, technology transfers, for an example. Now, say for an example, we are in Federation of Asia Pacific Retailers, all these countries, right? They can easily look at technology transfer from the biggest and mightiest from Japan to South Korea to you name all these countries. So that's another collaborative mechanism as to how you build this entire ecosystem of entrepreneurship. I know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> like, like the devil's advocate here. This kind of, I mean, this kind of collaboration, not only within the country, but, you know, with, country, with companies outside the country as well. Do you think it's challenging for small players um, or, or, or not? Um, is it something that only the big retail players can do? What, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so obviously the big players have an advantage. I mean, I must be truthful in that. They have an advantage. So that is why associations are important. They come in. Say for an example, if you take the Sri Lanka Retailers Association, they have the big and mighty and they have the small retailers as well. So uh, they come together for a common objective to be achieved. So similarly, you will find Japan Retailers Association or Philippine Retailers Association, and there can be collaborations between the associations where this transfer and medium is established. So that's one of the things that, you know, Asia Pacific Retail Federation is looking at in establishing uh, to see how retailers, irrespective of their size, can collaborate. Now, if you look at um, uh, places like India, the traditional retailers have transformed into being something very different. They have brought in, you know, uh, electronic payment systems and, you know, e-commerce. So they are able to fight even the big and mighty. You don't find this Walmart syndrome anymore. Any big retailer come in, they'll fight. So that's the level of uh, kind of improvement we should look at our um, retailers as well across Asia Pacific. It's all in the mindset. Absolutely. It's it's uh, such an insightful and in, in very interesting conversation, Mr. Prakash. But uh, I, I'm actually at my you know final question. Um, 
looking at, I mean, we spoke of the landscape, we spoke of what's happening now, not only in our region, but, you know, outside as well in the more developed uh, side of the world. If we look at the next 12 months, um, what are the major, more significant uh, retail trends that you're looking at that you can predict? A few things um, that comes to my mind. Um, first and foremost, most of these trends are related to one thing as I see. That's what I call personalization. If you look at over the last five years, one day, everything is geared towards how exactly do I personally tap that customer? What we used to study 25, 30 years back as possible of possibility of mass customization. So today it's a reality. You open your uh, TV, you open your phone, they'll say, okay, you bought this, why don't you buy this, that kind of thing. So, you know, in, in your trend, this will become an important integral part because it's about isolating the customer and giving him or her what they want. So that's the overarching thing, trend, I think will continue. As a means of enabling this, I have a few points that I'll leave with you. Um, one is the rise of artificial intelligence or more like the generative artificial intelligence. Now, uh, like I said before, you go to a um, website, they'll tell you what you bought last time, what you probably would want to buy today. They might even suggest some things that you should look for. So that's all predictive AI is possible because of this gen AI. So that is something has come to stay. And I think it also helps in terms of this personalization that I told you. And it also helps better customer engagement. Look at now, recently I learned that, you know, in India, the KFC uses what you call digital kernel. So the kernel Sanders has become digital, right? So there are uh, digital avatars, you know, digital influencers, you know, all this is happening. So that's why I say AI is going to play a major role specifically in retail, but even in other business areas. Then secondly, I also told you about re-commerce. I'm a pretty big believer that re-commerce is going to be big. Um, as I said, 64 billion is going to go up to 300 billion. And also the psyche of the younger consumers are very clearly in that. So even consumers like us, the baby boomers, have kind of got into that thinking because we feel that's the right thing to do by the planet. So there is that consciousness about the planet and, you know, economic well-being, all that plugged together. Thirdly, uh, I think you also would agree that there is a rise in social commerce. So, you know, kind of... You open the Facebook, there is a Facebook marketplace. You open the Instagram, there is a marketplace. So, you know, that's something that is very popular again with the younger generation. And all of us are also getting used to it. And I think there will be a proliferation of that to the next level. So that's another trend I see. And uh, finally, also, I feel this age-old uh, offline retail resurgence is happening. Uh, you know, brick and mortar will never go away. To date, we have about 65-70%. I think it will retain. But what people are trying to do is give that online experience offline. So you walk into a store. Now in US, there are some stores. You walk in. Uh, the entire product catalog is downloaded into your phone as you walk in. And then it gives predicted predictive analysis gives you, okay, this is what you bought, this is what it is. And you put everything into what you call a smart card. And it automatically bills you. You walk out, your credit card is charged. I'm saying at the extreme end. But even if you take a durable um, outlet or any other outlet, they will deploy technology to a much greater extent so that the younger generation would feel good coming in. So just to recap, uh, AI, uh, re-commerce, social commerce, and also this resurgence of the brick and mortar are some of the things that I see over the next 12 to 18 months that will happen in the entire region, uh, Rwandi. Exciting times ahead. Yeah. Uh I said it was my last question, but maybe I'll ask one final question. What is your message to retail players uh, in Sri Lanka, especially on how to, um, you know, kind of how to be ready to take charge of these trends and opportunities? So um, one of the things that we um, have in usually when new things come in is the fear of the unknown. Uh, you know, I always say when people talk about digitization and all that, I said there would have been a time where people would have feared electricity, right? We were born into an era where electricity was a normal thing, done thing. So I said, so that's the thing that people have to get over. So you got to embrace that change through technology and see how technology can work for you. Secondly, also a lot of people have this misnomer that, you know, you got to find some technology that works for you. No, 
you find the business problem and see how technology can help you so my um, to answer your question my message to retailers would be look at very optimistically positively the changes that are happening around you changes are happening you are getting uh, um, isolated because the customer is moving so if the customer is moving you got to ensure that your customer value chain is realigned and repositioned so that so that you get close to the customer so that's the message so continuously look at what the customer is doing where is he moving embrace the new technology look at external world positively bring collaborations for sri lanka particularly bring um, technology collaborations and other collaborations and try to move into the next level i think positive mindset to start with everything and that's what retailers do and you know that's probably what i would like to uh, say as a message we've been in conversation with the chairman of the federation of asia pacific retailers associations murali prakash mr prakash thank you for a very insightful conversation and it was absolutely lovely to have you on our show Thank you, Ruandi. It was an absolute pleasure being with you uh, for the last couple of minutes, and also let me thank LMD TV and the entire crew for this. Uh, until we meet another day, uh, thank you, and all the very best to you as well. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us. Until next time, take care. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and X. Thank you for watching, and stay safe.